From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Let's zoom in on March 2005, when Mad Money first went on the air on CNBC, 15 years ago this week. From Mad Money to March Madness, after a grueling tournament, North Carolina went on to defeat the Fighting Illini 75-70 to to take the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship, the Tar Heels' fourth title at the Edward James Dome in St. Louis. But on the other side of the world, there's problems. I went on the website of the World Health Organization last night. Yeah, my life is pretty dramatic that way. You know what they've got there? Disease outbreaks by month, by day, going back to 1996. March 4th, 2005, there's a report of dengue fever in East Timor. 336 hospitalized cases and 22 deaths. March 9th, 2005, plague in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 114 cases and 54 deaths. And March 11th, 2005, avian flu in Vietnam. That had been going on since January. 24 cases in that country, 13 of them fatal. Did any of that worry the market? The Dow begins that month, March 1st, closing at 10,830 and ends it March 30th at 10,540. A hefty loss of 300 points for the month. Where is it today? 26,121 as of the last close. Anyone who's been in the middle of the market on the volatility roller coaster of the last few weeks, the moms and dads watching their retirement nest eggs or college savings accounts pitch and roll has got to have wondered, is this all due to a new strain of coronavirus coming from Wuhan, China, and spreading across the globe, making you look at the stainless steel handrail of the number one train at Houston Street and asking yourself, is that thing really safe? Or are other market forces at foot? Were we spooked that corporate earnings had topped out, that Bernie Sanders was headed to the convention in Milwaukee as the presumptive Democratic nominee? That the big institutions and algorithmic traders were just looking to correct an overheated market, a market that has grown our 401ks steadily since January 2009. So step back. We know where the average investor goes for guidance. The show that takes the 6 p.m. time slot way back 15 years ago on CNBC. The host, do I even need to ask? A Philly kid. The kind of kid who sold ice cream at the vet during Phillies games, a kid who'd later gone to Harvard, edit the Crimson, cut his teeth as a newspaper reporter down in Tallahassee, and eventually found his way back to Cambridge, Harvard Law School, and eventually trading stocks at Goldman Sachs before hanging out his shingle at his own hedge fund. It was the go-go 80s, Wall Street, Manhattan, New York City. Was there any other place to be in 1987? At least until October 19th. When the Dow crashed 508 points, or 22.6% in one day. Do I need to remind you what happened just last week? February 24th, the Dow down 1,031. February 25th, down 879. February 27th, down 1190. The largest one-day drop in history. And yet, unlike 1987, only down 4.42% more than erased by the rise a few days later on March 5th of 1,293 points, or 5.09%, the largest one-day rise in history. But the next day, back down again. So where do we go from here? After the break, that Philly kid, Jim Cramer, The host of Mad Money, fresh off ringing the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange to mark the 15th anniversary of the debut of his show on CNBC. He's here inside the Ice House right after this. And now a word from John Van Sicklen, CEO of Dynatrace, NYSE ticker DT. 
we're a software intelligence company for the enterprise cloud. Software rules the world and we bring performance and intelligence to those who develop, operate, and drive business outcomes for the digital age. We sell our products in 70 different countries. Many of our customers trade on the NYSE. It is the enterprise class customer base that we target, and we're thrilled to be part of the family. Dynatrace is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Coming to the turnstiles of the New York Stock Exchange at 11 Wall Street every weekday morning is a man with a satchel loaded down with earnings transcripts and analyst reports making sense of the markets. I know, I see it every day. An institution on post nine on the NYSC floor when all those papers combine and find voice to create needed wisdom on the air. We've had his squawk on the street compadres on the show before, Carl Quintanilla when he was just back from the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang back in 2018, and David Faber regaling us with stories of his pursuit of Bernie Ebers among his other great scoops. We did that show last year. So today we complete the cycle. The legendary Jim Cramer. He just rang the opening bell of the NYSE to mark 15 years on the air as the host of Mad Money. And now he's here with us in the library before he heads to Englewood Cliffs just over the George Washington Bridge to record yet another episode of his decade and a half run, making us all smarter about the markets. Welcome, Jim. Well, you're way too kind. I, I, I feel that this is a time when I can really, I think, really dig back to when I started and recognize it wasn't a good time. There's never been a good time, and yet look where the market's gone. So I always urge people to think, it's been always something that's bad. This time it's a plague year. Other times it's a crash or maybe it's a, a recession or the, the Fed does what's wrong. What happens? Look where the market is. So let's not lose faith. It's been a sucker's game to bet against faith. But it is a different kind of time. You tweeted the other day that you carry a mask, gloves, and Purell. Gojo Industries, Jim, out of Akron, Ohio, the maker of Purell, is privately held. They could do a pretty robust IPO down on the floor if they wanted to. They sure could. Right now, there's a big shortage. Uh, I've been recommending the stock of Clorox CLX forever uh, because of bleach. Bleach kills everything. When I was a, a young reporter, I covered a train wreck. Uh, it was a bleach train. It was going to a paper factory. And uh, the five people died. I went in. I got blind. Uh, for a couple of days just because people don't realize how powerful bleach is, and that is Clorox at 170, still a buy. Your partner, Carl Continia, tweeted out pictures of the Duomo in Milan. No one there in the square but the pigeons. Not a lot of buyers of Alfa Romeos out there. No, and I was at the Lamborghini factory, which is about an hour from uh, Milan last year. I go to Milan uh, quite a bit, and uh, I was at Milan Fashion Week last year, and that was a, a time when they, many of the fashion designers were upset. There were many Asians there, uh, and the fashion designers all complained to me, they're here to copy. You know, that had been the resounding theme, and uh, it is. I do not think it's a coincidence that we had an outbreak in Milan. There's this international uh, group that descends on there, some of whom obviously were sick, and that is a, a country and part of the country that has an elderly population, well in excess of all other countries. We want to wish them well. Uh, I do a lot of business in Italy, and it's it's tragic that, that it's being hit so badly, but they're all covered. They're resilient people, and as we know from Rome. From Milan, Jim, to Philadelphia, your Flyers are hosting the Buffalo Sabres tomorrow night. They look at good. The Wells Fargo Center. They look good. You think we'll see empty stadiums in the U.S.? Yes. I think that in the end, uh, my school district just closed today, uh, which is uh, Central Bucks West, which is where I lived uh, after I got out of my, when I was at my hedge fund. And what was just shocking, that's, by the way, national title for football, is that these are uh, healthy people, healthy regions. And, and yet what you're trying to do is discourage people. Uh, if you have them, have your kids stay home from school, it does send a signal that you shouldn't go to the Flyers game. Uh, would I go to the Flyers game? Damn right. Because uh, they're good. And I know you could say, well, wait a second, Jim, you're being short-sighted. I, I carry my Purell. You heard what I do. I carry my gloves. Uh, I do care tremendously that I have those so that they give me the confidence. A lot of people want to shake my hand. And at this point, the network has advised that not to be the case. Uh, but I think that showing, I'm not, and I'm not, it's not a, it's not courageous to go to the Flyers. It's, it's, you take prudent actions. I, I'm not going to, uh, I, I'll kiss my wife, but that's about it. I watched your interview just go down with Larry Kudlow. My memories go back to 
pictures of Bill Clinton and Bob Rubin on the Rose Garden steps, of Hank Paulson and George Bush during the financial crisis. You've been talking a lot this morning about the nation's need to have something akin to the Manhattan Project. Right. Look, I, I think that there are a lot of people right now who seem envious of the Chinese and their totalitarian ways and how they were able to cut back on the illness because they did things that we could never do. I'm proud that we could never do those things because we are a democracy. But what we do best is capture the tremendous ingenuity of our country. I interview a lot of the drug CEOs. There's so many great scientists here. If we had them focus on monoclonal antibodies that would work, if we had them focus on a vaccine and really just put them in an Alamogordo like place, I think that would be better than trying to give everybody in the country money. Why? Because I am so proud of the people who we all went to school with who are smarter than us, who went on to these fabulous institutions and can invent, not unlike when I was a little boy and I was told not to go outside because there was polio. Mm. And then suddenly there was a man named Salk who solved polio. Uh, There's a man named Fauci who works with the president who solved AIDS. These were all things that weren't supposed to be solved. I want, uh, I'd like to, to put as much money as possible into the hands of those with ingenuity who I believe will solve this rather than making us a police state uh, because that is not the way our country solves things. As Bob Rubin would say, Jim, markets go up, markets go down, but mad money endures. So congratulations <laughs> oh, on 15 oh, years one, of booyahs. One last thing I'd just like to say. Uh, my dad was in the Pacific. He had nine hot landings. He was in the 6th Army. Uh, they were supposed to land uh, on the southernmost tip of, of Japan. And he was ready. He was part of an invasion force. They knew where they had to go. And then ingenuity, we dropped the atomic bomb. I know some people are these days saying that maybe that wasn't right. I wouldn't have been born. And I think this country is a great place. And we beat a totalitarian nation then. And we'll beat this now without the help of totalitarian ways. And because you were born, Jim Cramer, there have been 15 years of mad money. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I don't know if they were on the bombing run, getting ready, doing practice, and they said booyah, but where did that expression come booyah from? Booyah came from my old radio show where someone in uh, New Orleans, my affiliate, uh, said that he uh, had made a huge amount of money in a stock and he didn't know what we said in the North, but he said in the South, we say booyah. And then uh, next caller said, well, I don't know, I guess I should say booyah too. And uh, there is something that is uh, magnetic about the term and it stuck with me. I love it. I love it. It's signature. I watched you and your team at the podium of the New York Stock Exchange, a very different image than uh, irrational exuberance over the last 15 years. What were your feelings up there with your team around you, with your colleagues on this walk on the street set on post nine in front of you and looking out on this institution that has been such an important part of your life? Well, the first thing I thought of was when we were in five, five years where my father and I rang the bell. And I love my father very much. He was 92 when he passed. And he, every day at seven o'clock, he would call me when the show's over. He goes, James E., that was the best show you've ever done. Every night he said it. Sometimes I said, oh my God, it's seven o'clock. There's my father with the James E. I think every minute at seven o'clock, wow, oh, geez, I wish my dad would call and say, James E., that was the best show ever. Uh, we have an amazing team. I've got a great network. I'm so proud of the work we do on the stock exchange and uh, the history to be part of that history uh, is chilling. And I think people should recognize the greatness of this institution. I think we're having a resurgence of individual investors among younger people. And what they should do is study the most actives and look at what companies come public and try to find the next big one because they're out there and you'll find them here. And that's why I love to focus on the New York Stock Exchange because younger people get Get to make money for their future by taking a little more risk than I can now at my age, or maybe I could have taken 15 years ago when we started Mad Money. I mean, before we get to the legacy of Mad Money, Jim, let's tackle the tale of two markets that you shared with your viewers on Wednesday night. You framed it like a boxing match. Let's go to the Rumble in the Jungle, Kinshasa Zaire, October 30th, 1974, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman. All times does Ali. Foreman throwing more punches now. Maybe this could be the tactic of Ali to let the man punch himself out. 30 seconds left in round eight. Very even fight. Ali, a sneaky right hand. Another sneaky right hand. This time he works over the shoulder of Foreman.
29 seconds left in the eighth round, Jim. The bond market is forming. The stock market is is Ali. Is that the way you see it? Yes, I do. And of course, Ali was the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And our stock market is the greatest of all time. I believe ultimately our stock market is made up of companies that have incredible balance sheets, certainly better than the United States, uh, that pay good dividends that are far bigger than what the bond market will offer. And right now, the bond market is engendering fear. It's saying that, listen, the economy is going to collapse. I think the economy can have a setback, service, travel, leisure, which, by the way, are all flying today. Those stocks, uh, they always defy the uh, negativity. Um, I remain convinced that we will get through this. It won't be easy. None of these challenges are easy in the 15 years since we're doing mad money, but uh, particularly in the 2007-2009 period. But I want to point out, that was a period where the institutions were shaky, where you were worried about the ATM working, where you couldn't believe that you would think, I can't keep that much money in that bank. I actually put my money in multiple banks because you only had at that point $100,000 insurance. I'm blessed to be able to be lucky enough to have uh, money that I needed to be able to spread around. I'm certainly not trying to say, hey, I'm rich, but I'm just saying that that was the tenor of that time. I don't feel that now. Yes, I worry about personal safety. Yes, the numbers are not good for someone my age. Yes, I have to think about it. And it's, on, it's top of mind uh, because health is always more important than money. But I have to give our viewers some facts, not some fear, because the facts trump the fear any day of the week. You just talked to Kudlow this morning. Here's President Trump from last Tuesday, a little chopper talk from the South Lawn of the White House reacting to the Fed's move earlier in the week. Uh, I would say that the Fed re funds rate, the rate, as you would call it, is too high. Uh, it should be eased down so that we're competitive. Look, we have the greatest country in the world. We have the strongest country in the world. It's our dollar that the world relies on. We should have the low rate. But we have a Fed that doesn't agree with that. I disagree with them. I've kept my eye on you this week, Jim. Looking forward to this conversation. I saw your reaction on air to Jay Powell's half point rate cut. Your face, always so expressive, seemed to say it all. It was a look of concern, I think. What's your message to those most on the mind of SEC Chairman Jay Clayton, Mr. and Mrs. 401k? Well, I, I did not like what Jay Powell did. I've been critical of the Fed, Fed periodically. Jay was much too tight at the end of 2018. Uh, what concerned me is, is that they have a Fed meeting coming up, and if this is a really tough time, could there be a better moment than to cut at a Fed meeting and then have a press conference and lay out that? So a, a regularly scheduled cut is fine. Uh, a cut that just shocked us uh, has left us where? Has left us with a bond market that's in tatters tatters in terms of the wrong way of rates going down has left us with tremendous fear that maybe the things we don't know. Um, Jay Powell, and I've known Jay for many years, what he did was make me fearful and uh, that trifle with the facts, and I don't like that. On your show Wednesday night, you opened with a big screen shot of the S&P short range oscillator from marketedge.com. It's a service that you pay for, sort of your own security blanket to tell, tell you what's what. What does it tell you and what should it tell us? Uh, we're at a level of oversold, so to speak, where there's too much selling that is uh, almost unmatched other than 2007, 2009. So you could say, well, there were the, we saw five occasions where we were down this much, minus 12. I guess it is my proprietary. I've been watching it since 86 when I took it and it came by hand Saturday morning. Uh, but when I look at that and I say, there's been, of the five times, four of them were buying opportunities. And the fifth one was a delayed buying opportunity. It actually was down this level when Warren Buffett wrote that perhaps we should be buying stocks. Buy America IM was a piece. It was October 16th of uh, 20, uh, 2008. It was in the New York Times. He was wrong by 2,000 Dow points. So you could say, well, wait a second. What a clown. He bought at 8,000, went to 6,500. 8,500 went to 6,500. I say, look, you can't even see that blip down in, in the Dow. And am I too bullish? I'm not bullish or bearish. I'm realist. And I'm realist in saying that there are plenty of companies that are doing well. Uh, there are plenty of stocks that I like. Are there more stocks uh, that I don't like? Absolutely. Because I do believe that earnings matter and the earnings are going to be uh, negative for a lot of companies. There's a lot of stocks that are up uh, that I think... Uh, Look, travel and leisure really should not be rallying because people are worried about their health. They don't travel. But at the same time, they're bargains. Uh, and I know that sounds cavalier. Uh, but in 2007, I said, if you needed your money, sell it. And I said it on national TV. Uh, in 2009, when my late friend Mark Kane said, buy it, I said, I agree with him. 
uh, you went from 12,000 to 6,500. It was a nice miss, uh, even with taxes. And then you got back in. Now, yes, it's, was it elegant? No. Was it right? Yes. And I think that we're not yet approaching the, uh, we're already past the point where if you really wanted to sell something, you could. I, I don't encourage selling until we bounce. Uh, but I do think that you have to high grade your portfolio. Get out of the stocks that aren't going to uh, do well in this period. Get in the stocks. You know, Get out of the Carnival Cruises and get into the Johnson & Johnsons. It's not so hard. This one really green spot this week, uh, up 5.04% on Wednesday, following on Super Tuesday, Jim Senator Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the presidential race yesterday, leaving only Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders to vie for the Democratic nomination. It wasn't too long ago from above the floor of the NYSE that you quizzed Senator Warren about her plans. Let's take a listen. Senator, one of the things we talk about mad money is that they're more than just shareholders, they're stakeholders. Yeah. You produced a very thoughtful article in the Wall Street Journal about co companies shouldn't be accountable only to shareholders. Tell us about it. All right. So you know how American economy worked for decades, shoot for centuries. And that was that the biggest companies in this country had multiple responsibilities. Responsibility to their shareholders, to their employees, to their customers, and to the communities that they were involved in. And it worked. Right. Right? Everybody got richer. And we're uh, coming back to it like a sales force is saying it, but the vast majority of that's right. Back. Stock market went up. Uh, uh, productivity goes up. And workers do better. We built the great American middle class. We built the great American middle class. Beyond being on your program, did she get an adequate chance to rebuild the great American middle class? No, she actually made, Senator Warren made some really great points. Uh, she actually uh, had constructed a, a document that was actually not her own to some degree. It was thoughts of Reagan. Uh, in 1980, I was a great fan of President Reagan, and I great fan of what he did with the economy. And we were kicking that around about how she is now in what was the Reagan camp uh, in terms of uh, getting it so that the workers made more money, the CEOs, Reagan would have been astonished how much more the CEOs made than the rank and file. That was not his way. Uh, that great man understood that there shouldn't be such disparities of wealth, and that's really what Senator Warren was talking about. Now, Senator Warren came on my show because I was at war with her during the uh, period when the economy was not not strong because I had defended the banks and she was unhappy with my defense of the banks. I was trying to keep the banks alive and she felt that the bank sh bankers should be punished. And we managed to come up with a rapprochement to the point where I uh, regularly uh, talk with her. Um, I think she's incredibly bright. By the way, she was the candidate that both my daughters favored, just so you know where I'm coming from. They, they are trying to figure out what to do with uh, Senator Sanders. Uh, but there is, without a doubt, a genuine nature to her. I think that her campaign got too ugly. But I think she's a very solid soul, and she's a member of the democracy that we all treasure. Uh, certainly entitled to her views, not necessarily all of them my views, but she had very thoughtful things to say about business. So if Reagan is the baseline... And I'm with you on that. I'm as much of a fan of him as you are. What is the state of the middle class and how might it fare under four more years of President Trump or four very different kind of years under either Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders? Well, let's just say that uh, hate him or like him, the president's been incredible for the economy and, and the jobless numbers are extraordinary. I still can't believe I was looking at them and always just astonished. Asian unemployment, 2%. African-American unemployment, uh, so low. It, it's very ch uh, cheering. And I know that what's about to occur with the coronavirus is going to change those numbers. But uh, it's been heartening. And again, they're hate him or like him. It's been an incredibly heartening moment for the economy. Do I feel that the middle class is was benefiting? It was actually starting to come back. I hope it doesn't go away. They're finally getting some higher wages and they can have jobs. Uh, they're plentiful and that's great for the middle class. I am not a fan of pay packages that award CEOs uh, millions and millions of dollars. I'm going to mention someone who's disgraced, Les Moonves. He made he was the highest paid executive in this country, uh, making more than $50 million a year. And uh, that astonishes me. He wasn't worth it. And I think there are a lot of CEOs where they are – the comp committee on the board of directors is looking at other CEOs in that same industry, and they just keep ratcheting and ratcheting ratcheting up their pay. That should stop. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, I think the workers should make more. Can you imagine if they, if each worker at CBS got some of Les Moonves' contract, they'd be able to afford to be able to get a couple of years mortgage money for heaven's sake. I, I, so I agree with Senator Warren and, and you know President Reagan. I, I think that the middle class needs to have a champion. 
uh, and uh, the is she the right champion? I'm not sure. I think that President Trump was doing very well by the middle class for economics. Uh, there are other issues that he and I certainly disagree on. I've known him for many, many years. Uh, Larry Kudlow, of course, was my partner before Mad Money. He was my mm-hmm. partner for yep. three years. And I enjoy his company and like his views very, very much. I know he was, was often roundly criticized for being an optimist. Can we have some optimism? It is refreshing. He and I disagree on what will happen with uh, the coronavirus, uh, but we don't disagree about the notion that our country uh, will triumph over it. So as we head toward our break, Jim, what will happen with the coronavirus? You get a lot of your information from a lot of different places. One of them is from former FDA chief Scott Gottlieb. Here he is with Margaret Brennan on CBS's Face the Nation just a few days ago. You served in the Trump administration. Uh, What do you think the administration is doing now that is right, wrong in its handling of the virus? Right. Well, certainly expanding the diagnostic capability is the right move. Um, We're going to have the capacity by the end of this week to diagnose probably 10,000 people a day or screen 10,000 people a day with the public health labs, 100 labs doing 100 tests a day. By the end of the week after that, we'll probably bring on another 10,000. So we'll have testing capacity of perhaps as much as 20,000 a day by the end of the next two weeks once we bring on the academic labs. That was really a critical step, bringing on those academic labs Mm -hmm. and and leveraging their capacity. These are the major medical centers. Um, What we need to do now is make a real concerted effort to get a therapeutic. We know when this started, but we don't know when this is going to end. And what's going to end it is our technology. Our savior here is going to be our technology. And we need to make a really robust effort to try to develop a therapeutic. Developing a therapeutic is essentially, Jim, our faith in the technology of drug companies and this institution that provides them the capital to do what the work they've got to do. Plus, I think you'd say with the Manhattan style project, the government stepping in to help. Yeah, well, look, you have to make that kind of declaration because it gives uh, hope that we can do better. And hope is not a bad thing, uh, that we can solve this thing. Dr. Gottlieb is someone whose company I I enjoy tremendously, and he's been dead right the whole way. I'm certainly not going to disagree with him. Uh, And I know that uh, I I always uh, hope for the best but prepare for the worst. And the worst would obviously be that it's going to be a long time to come up with a vaccine. Vaccines are very hard to do because, remember, you've got to make – you've got to – get a person on a vaccine and then you got to give them something that could kill them. That is not something that the medical profession is comfortable with. Uh, we also have had a very checkered history coming up with successful vaccines. Uh, in terms of the care, I'd like to think that we can get people out of the hospital by um, creating some medicines that would make it so that the, uh, the pneumonia would be, uh, let's say, at least uh, tamped down so that you can get people back home because when you stay in the hospitals, when you die. Uh, I am, again, uh, not Hopeful near term, but hopeful longer term. After the break, we celebrate 15 years and more of the career of Jim Cramer from the mean streets of Winmore, Pennsylvania, to the set of Mad Money in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. That's right after this. And now a word from Calvin Choi, CEO of AMTD, NYSE ticker HKIB. We are the first Hong Kong independent investment bank to list here. It's so unique coming here to list because we want to embrace internationalization. We want to go global. This is a global exchange. We want to embrace global connectivity. A is adventure. M is actually mission. T is actually teamwork. D is the destination. NYC as our destination. MTD now lists on the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome back. Before the break, Jim Cramer, the host of Mad Money on CNBC, which this week celebrates its 15th anniversary on air. And I were talking about the current state of the market from coronavirus to the presidential campaign. We're now going to take a little trip back in time. Your mom was an artist, Jim, and your dad owned a business that sold paper products. What did they both teach you that we can see manifested on the set of your show today? Uh, Hard work and truth. My mom stood for the notion that if you work really hard in this country, you do well. And my father said, no matter what, even if it's a setback, you tell the truth. Uh, Interestingly enough, my father's business was wiped out by the Chinese. Uh, He sold boxes and bags that were made in America. And uh, all the mills that he represented uh, closed because the Chinese targeted the gift wrap industry and targeted the bag industry. He ended up spending his last 20 years of his life working for the Chinese who were quite uh, graceful and uh, and respectful of my father. He sold uh, bags to restaurants. He would sketch the uh, he would sketch the 
logo of the restaurant and then go inside the restaurant and say, listen, I can make you a paper bag, not plastic. My father is very forward looking mm-hmm. uh, and it will have your name and it will be the way to be able to uh, people save the bag. And it turned out to be a boon. My father in his late seventies began a very successful business of doing restaurant bags and he did it yet a very big month in the month of October of uh, 2014. He died in November of 2014. So at 92, I'll talk about hard work, amazing. It's been so long uh, since my mom passed. Uh, it has been, uh, it was 1985. She was in her uh, mid-50s and she was indeed an artist. Uh, I remember her and I love her, but I've got to tell you, it is hard to think about, to, I remember her voice. Um, but I would urge people, by the way, if you have a relative that is that is about to leave this earth, record their voice. Mm. So I could hear my mom in my head, but I miss her very much all the time. Uh, but I know that she favored the hard work that got me to where I am. And I thank you, Mom. You started selling stocks in the fourth grade. We had Stuart Frankel here in the library last year. He's, his dad told him to start following and buying IBM to pay for a baseball jacket that he coveted at a local sporting goods store. You made enough money buying and selling stocks to pay your tuition at Harvard Law. What were the names you traded back then? Well, I, I had a very big position uh, in Intel. Uh, which was terrific. Texas Instruments did very well for me. Uh, I was, uh, Monolithic Monolithic Memories was a very good stock. And uh, I was able to, you know, catch a kind of a semiconductor revolution during the mid 80s. Uh, I was, uh, by the way, instrumental, I think, in uh, bringing Microsoft public when when I went to Goldman Sachs because my college roommate, my junior summer year was Steve Ballmer and was able to prevail upon uh, Microsoft to use Goldman Sachs. I didn't get any fee because I poached. I was not supposed to be in the Seattle territory. Uh, that was I have great chagrin about that. that. That company, Microsoft, would have gone to another firm. And I am a competitive fellow, and I should have been rewarded for it a <laughs> long time ago. But uh, yeah, I, I bought, what I have was an answering machine where I'd say, I'm not here right now, but I think you should buy monolithic memories. And <laughs> the way I got my start was that there was a wealthy individual who kept calling and calling to get a hold of me, and then just said, the hell with him. I'll call when he's not there, when he's at school. And uh, he made a fortune off the answering machine and gave me a check for $500,000 when he saw me. Every show has a story of its founding. Don Hewitt launched 60 Minutes on the heels of producing the Kennedy-Nixon debates. What did it take to get mad money off the ground? Well, uh, this was a show that the previous management at uh, CNBC did not like and told me would never happen. Uh, And then I was going to leave the network. And then uh, the new CEO came in, uh, Jeff Zucker, and uh, Jeff uh, said, wait a second, this is a good idea. Now, what did I propose that was rejected? Well, I said, look, I want to do a one-man show about business. It's going to be like Johnny Carson. I'll come out, I'm going to do a monologue, and I'll do a skit, and then I'll interview some people, and then I'll do another skit, and that will be the show. And the previous CEO said, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You'll never see that. And uh, Jeff Zucker said, you know what? we got to give this a try. We keep losing. Every every time we start something at 6 o'clock, it fails. Uh, And... uh, he said, we got to give this a run. I said, how much time do I have? He said, you got a month to pull it together. Hmm. And uh, we did, and that's why we got it. it was supposed to Jan- My contract was up in, at the beginning of January. Uh, I went dark during the month of January. In February, we practiced, and in March, we went on air, and the rest is history. You've got a Mad Money Manifesto posted on CNBC.com in which you write, for years I've been trying to help people like you who own stocks and feel like they're on the outside looking in become better investors. That's the mission statement, plain and simple. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, I think that we're one of the things that's going to happen right now is that we've peaked in, when it comes to uh, index investing. It's now 60%. I like indexes. I, I can't own individual stocks. But the what we're starting, it's starting to dawn on us that there are individual companies some are better than others, that the idea of a basket of the S&P, which did not exist in 1984, I started trading in 1979, uh, was a better world. And uh, when you have faith in companies rather than lack of faith in an index, uh, then you're going to start making some money. And I think that uh, that view has been discredited by professors and by an industry that treats the people who watch my show as if they're um, idiots and infidels, and they're anything but. They're 
my, they're the treasure of Mad Money and Regina Gilgan and my executive producer and I talk quite a bit about the idea that we have to get back to mm. the concept of picking stocks, buying advanced micro because it's good, buying a Costco. And just this indexing is really an effrontery, I think, to a lot of people who have kids that could have spotted Facebook or could have spotted Amazon. And you shouldn't check your brains at the door just because of the uh, – of the doctrine of indexing. I mean, I, I watched your show last night. Talk about these kids. I watched the calls you took last night. There's a guy named Lee Sr. He put his son, Lee Jr., on the phone to talk about electronic arts. He's just a kid, Jim. Two generations on a single call. Talk about the relationships you create with your viewers. Well, look, we're about the viewers. I've always felt that you cannot ever stray from the concept of who is watching, because they are your they are your real stakeholder. They're your bosses. Uh, and when we have generational calls like that, what it says is we could be in for a uh, longer run than just 15 years. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that a lot of younger people do watch. We used to have a college tour that was very exciting. There, there's a, a group out there represented by Robinhood, which has 10 million uh, uh, clients that say, you know what? Uh, I'll do some indexing, but I really want to f- uh, come up with the next Zoom video. I want to come up with the next Beyond Meat. I want to uh, come up with with the, with the next Twitter when it uh, when it went down to sixteen, and, uh, or Disney when it's off thirty points from its high. And, and I I encourage these people to, to do homework and if you can watch the show, do some homework, get comfortable, or uh, the old Peter Lynch method of investing, a great mutual fund manager from Magellan, which is to take a look at you know have your eyes open, see things you like, and and then uh, dig down a little bit, be sure the company's got a good balance sheet and it's got good prospects, and then buy it. Uh, now let's become quaint, old-fashioned, and discredited. And it is my mission to make it that you that the people who discredited it are revealed for the charlatans that I really think they are. Because uh, when I'm at this great institution, the New York Stock Exchange, I recognize that these are companies. They're not just pieces of paper bundled together by greedy individuals who think that that's the only way to invest. Do I have invective toward these people? No, my viewers do and I represent my viewers, I think, strongly, and that's why I've been on for 15 years. You end your manifesto saying, I sometimes play a clown too, and I'm proud of it. I can't teach if you're not watching. Yeah, I mean, look, I obviously am, I am given to hyperbole. What I'm trying to say is, you know, I know I have to entertain to watch you. I say at the beginning of the show, it's about, I'm going to entertain. I, I, I'm also going to educate and teach. And the reason I say that is because all the great educators I ever had made it interesting and made it amusing. Why? Because of the, the actual matter is dry and it's up to you to be able to keep people captivated. I think that the longevity of the show has to do with the fact that I try to keep people captivated any way I can. Have I played a clown? Of course. Is that uh, undignified? Absolutely. Do I care? Well, 15 years says you bet I have to care mm. in favor of the viewer's entertainment so the, inter- so the viewer doesn't skip by the show. I am uh, involved in a commercial enterprise. Those who are holier than now who think that they are not involved in commercial enterprise are are greatly mistaken and ill-advised. I have to do what's necessary to get you to watch. As long as I tell the truth, as my father said, that I'm doing a good job. As much as you're working 19 hours a day, writing a lot of your scripts in the limo, no one accomplishes anything great by themselves. Your team was all around you on the podium of the New York Stock Exchange to ring the opening bell from Regina on down the list to your colleagues at CNBC. What exemplifies the team effort? Uh, first, eighty percent women. Uh, I am always a poor. Uh, I, I abhor a lack of diversity. I think it's really important to point that out. That Regina Gilgan has sought to have the best. Now, what did the best turn out to be? Women. It is a meritocracy, and I feel that women are discriminated against, and that's something that we work hard to be able to change on Mad Money. Uh, Our team is a team that has got my back at all times. The show would look quite different without them. My head writer and only writer uh, is Cliff Mason, who happens to be my sister's kid. He started writing for us uh, when he was in high school uh, and said he wanted to get rid of all the other writers, and he would do it himself, and he went to Harvard. He was a high-energy physicist. physics major uh, with a Latin and Greek uh, uh, minor, and uh, that's not bad. And he has been our head writer the whole way, and I can't do the show without him. Uh, ben Stoto, our research director, so many good people. Linda Dimion's fantastic. I th- Heather Gaines, Katie Spencer. And, and of course, I, I want to thank uh, Mark Hoffman, who was the person who not only uh, has been our biggest supporter after Jeff Zucker left, but also the person who has uh, felt that the heart and soul of our show is about the viewer, and therefore it must be preserved. And uh, I'm quite proud of that. 
It's Friday, Jim. It's been quite a week. Once a year, at least, thanks to you and your colleague, Brian Steele, I unwind at Bar San Miguel, the restaurant <laughs> you own in Brooklyn. When Friday comes around and the markets are closed for 48 hours, how do you unwind? What will you Mezcal. do this weekend? Mezcal, Bar San Miguel. Got a whole new shipment of some stuff that I'm making. I'm making some juice that I think is going to be absolutely terrific. Terrific called Fosforo. It is better than any other Mezcal I have at my bar. We've been sampling it. People like it. Uh, Lisa Detweiler, my wife, uh, was here ringing the op- to ring the opening bell with me. She was certainly she was in the audience. She wasn't part of the team, and uh, she has not told me yet what we do, uh, what we're doing. Uh, I know that uh, I kind of get some weekends that I I get to uh, do things like Dave with Dave Cody, the former CEO of Honeywell, where we'll go hunting, and that's uh, great. And then we had a birthday party for me, my 65th, not that long ago. Uh, all my friends are turning 65. I went to another one last week. I'm not sure what she has in mind, but she knows that I need some rest after this week. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that I was optimistic at the opening bell on a day that was supposed to be horrendous uh, has to do with man money and has to do with our viewers knowing that I have their back and what that means is not getting fearful and not spreading uh, a gospel that just says get out now or that uh, that I treat uh, that I'm a chicken little uh, we have people come on the network who are chicken littles and I don't want to call them out because they're a very nice people who are on our network quite a bit there's no reason to disparage them but I urge people to recognize that there is always a bull market somewhere and I'm going to find it for them there's always a bull market somewhere. It's always five o'clock somewhere. You've done a number of shows over the summer from the Experience Square right outside the New York Stock Exchange. I watched the connection you have with the passers-by at the corner of Wall and Broad Street. It's like a block party. All you need is a little Jimmy Buffett. Can we get more of that this summer? We got to get Jimmy Chill. Uh, because Jimmy Chill is somebody who is uh, my older ego that my daughter Cece came up with saying, listen, you got to chill. Uh, you got to be Jimmy Chill. And that is the one you see on the street. Uh, I do hope that we beat this coronavirus so I can give people the high fives that makes it so that it's so much fun. This uh, this uh, shoulder sleeve thing is it really leaves me cold. Uh, but I uh, yes, those are people who watch the show. And I'm proud that they come to the show every night. I'm proud that they are, enjoy the hunt uh, for the next big stock. Uh, I'm proud that they're not totally brainwashed into just 100% index funds. I've always felt that index funds should be the bedrock, and then you should put some of your mad money, hence the title, into stocks. Uh, that is something that has been discredited uh, by people who look down on our audience, and I've got our audiences back, and I know where you guys are who are making our audience feel like they're idiots. And they've got your back too, Jim. Yep, for another 15 years of this? Yes. Absolutely. Unqualified. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Jim Cramer, host for 15 years now of Mad Money, weeknights at 6 p.m. on CNBC. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at icehousepodcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Stephen Romanchik. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Booyah! Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 